Hi there, Liam. Hope you're having a good week. Uh, definitely had a good week at the recital on Sunday and the Park Hills Home Tour was very successful, so I had a very nice weekend. Um, we missed having you there. It'd been cool to have uh, have you play one of the pieces with one of the other uh, other teen students up there too. So cool, maybe uh, maybe next time. Um, so uh, I had a chance to review your video. A lot of good things in there. I'll go down the list. And if you have questions, or me to look at anything, feel free to shoot that over and I'll be do my best to answer your questions. All right, so first thing is your exercise, your, um, your three, four, uh, third finger, fourth finger, five string split is looking good. Make sure it's a classical position. Um, it'll make all the difference, I think, in, 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 in making the shifts even, even easier to, to, to make. There's a reason why a lot of the shred players, not just classical, but to any genre, they sit in that kind of orientation of the guitar is because it makes accessing the fretboard way easier. Um, it makes the stretches a whole lot easier. It's more ergonomic, I suppose. So anyway, so I saw you doing this, which was really nice. What I really like was that, that you're keeping your fingers hovering over top of the frets. So that was really nice. So you're not doing anything like weird like this. That's all looking good. Um, maybe try a different exercise with this um, because this pops up in book, book four, I wanna say. Um, may as well start working on it now, right? Is that you can start in a six string split, right? So here I got my finger on the low G on the sixth string and get my finger on the high G here on the on the uh, first string. And you do what's called contrary motion. Contrary motion is where the two voices kind of contract together um, and then you can expand out. So we're moving in opposite directions. Like this one's moving down, this one's moving up. Instead of like um, uh, similar motion moving up this way or moving down this way or oblique motion moving against like that. Um, so we have a contrary motion here. Now it's an exercise that's not meant to sound good. <laughs> it's just like a drill. So. Right, so we can really start strengthening that back part of the hand right here as you're finding a lot of book three stuff. Is a lot of this, a lot of this, a lot of Swiss and turn, a lot of like things like, like things like that. All right. So practice that for me. Um, and then going back to your book three, A major tonalization, looking nice, like I said, um, that A, M, I, A, M, I, A, M, I is looking nice. Right, you can maybe just be a, t a touch more, uh, more supinated um, for this exercise. So be a bit more touch, uh, just a touch over a little bit more. I heard a little bit of like, bit of that in there not like I said not very much but it did pop up and we had to be, be careful about that and keep an eye on it so a m i make sure these fingers are over top the strings a bit more so our free stroke position is different this is where I differ from like a lot of Suzuki teachings is that my teacher Ricardo um, believed that um, that you can pivot off the thumb here for different orientations for free stroke for ready for rest stroke and then for free strokes. If you watch him, I can usually spot some of his students when they play because there's a whole lot of this going on, right? Um, versus the Suzuki, they kind of keep it more regular over top and you switch. Around. I was never comfortable doing that. I that's not the way I was raised, so I do it my way. Um, so with your tonalization, um, what I want you to add on to it is P M P I P M P I P M P I. Still do A M I. That's still a thing that you do. When I would work on arpeggios, I would have like a set that I would do every day. So like maybe every day I might do like three or four different arpeggio exercises, and I would do do that block, and then the next day I come do another block. So that way, like on my sheet of arpeggios. I would like rotate through through them all like within a week. I would hit every one of them. Like, I would do like an easy one and a hard one and a medium one every day, like something like that. Um, like, so I think so far we have seven or eight. I want to say eight arpeggio exercises. Eight, I think at this point, we have eight arpeggio exercises. So if you do like two a day, you know you get all of them you know, roughly within a week or so. But adding this one in, so P M P I P M P I. Uh, you can do that with the E major scale. Uh, the reason why you want to practice that one, uh, because there's a, there's a funny thing that happens in, in book two and book three and book four, um, where, like I said before, like the, the heavens didn't open up one day and then divine Suzuki text fell from the sky and landed in, in Frank Gongay and um, William Kostler's lap. 
uh, out in the field somewhere, I don't know, out in the desert, and, and they go, oh my God, these are sacred texts, you know, they're, they're perfect. They're not perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect method, and Suzuki's already not even a method, it's just a collection of works. Um, graded in an order uh, with some suggestions on, on, um, on exercises to accompany said pieces um, and then edits to those as well. They're always being worked on, right? And what they did with book two is they found a lot of book two students were quitting because when they got to piece, when they would get to Allegretto, the ninth piece in, in book two, they found that a lot of students just couldn't get past it. It was just a Herculean task. I even had students get through this piece, and before I knew this, were like, why is this piece here? This is hard. Um, and there's, there's some, uh, I guess, from the last I heard, there's some, some uh, controversy in the Suzuki teacher community. It's like, do you even teach this piece in this book? And some teachers do, and some teachers like, I subscribe to. We move that to book three. So what ended up happening is we're going to go take a piece from book two that was my opinion way too difficult for that ability level and we're going to jump it into book three so it's not like me doing it it's this it's just like a large consensus of teachers who like say like mary lou for example who i studied with she suggested just move it to book three it's way better there and i think it then it's true the reason why i think that is because in uh, book book three there's that it can send an a major arpeggio <laughs> I, P, M, P, I. And it just so happens that happens in Allegretto from book two. So it makes better sense. That happens there. P, M, P, I, P, M. So P, M, P, I, P, M, P, I, P, A, M, I. Wait a minute there. That's a combination of those two arpeggio exercises from book three. So it makes far better sense, either two options, either we move that PMPI free stroke exercise into mid book two, where it's a student's just learning to get their fingers wrapped around that, or we move that piece that requires a technique into where it's introduced, where the student's technically developed to be able to play that arpeggio. And I think this latter is the better place to put it. So, so what you'll do from that PMPI in preparation for the Allegretto, the uh, Caroli Allegretto. Practice that for me. Um, and then lastly is Packington's Pound. I like it. I like the first part, it flows nice, making sure you're still doing those AMI patterns in there, because that's a huge thing in classical guitar. But you remind me of a young me in the fact that I like to play my guitar and <laughs> And I would play the parts that sounded good because I liked it because it made me sound good. And I like that. Everyone likes that. But what you have to do is you have to practice what you don't know, right? Um, the only thing holding us from going on to the Gerbizzo is just a little bit more work on the A major tonalization and being able to play the B section of the Packington's Pound. So really it's a matter of you. And there's nothing that physically you can play the song. You just need to do it. So like for me, I would have, when I was a younger guy, I might have like not played that middle section as much because I didn't like it as much or like I didn't, couldn't play it yet. So then when I sit down to practice or as I say, playing, um, I wouldn't practice that section. And I would leave it to my teacher who I would play, I'd be playing for, so say if you were playing for him and I came with crystal ball and kind of maybe visual what he might have said to you was that he would, he would, you would have played and you would have gotten to that B section and he would have wailed on you the whole lesson for that B section. He wouldn't be even interested in hearing the A section again or the, the, where the theme comes back again. He's like, we're not moving forward in anything until you can play the notes of the B section cleanly, which maybe I should do to you. Because um, I remember getting that, like a section like this and like, whew, I guess I made it through that one. I'm gonna keep on going the part I like. And he's like, nope, back over to the part that you can't play yet because no one's gonna wanna hear you play half a song, right? So what I want you to do is I want you to focus on making sure you can play that B section, that right, and then back. Right back into that right there. But you gotta play that one line of music. <laughs> It'd be a darn shame if you got through, uh, got to pack into town and couldn't move on because there was like one, two, three, four measures that were unlearned. So I know you can play the A section really well, but please learn that B section. And making sure that you do the A, uh, A, uh, sorry, uh, what was it? A, M, A, M, I, 
I A I A M I A. Making sure you do that A M I pattern in that part right there. Work on that for me. Like I said, if you want me to look at anything, shoot it on over. And if you don't have any questions, I will see you same time next time. Take care.